All right. Well, welcome to CXM at MSU Presents, a monthly roundtable. I'm Tom DeWitt. I'm the director of CXM at MSU, and I'm joined by Alistair Meffin, who is a VP of Customer Experience from Definitive Healthcare and our facilitator of this session. So I'm going to turn it over to you, um, Alistair, to explain what we're doing here today and introduce our guest. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. So, uh, so welcome everybody to our August edition of the our monthly roundtable. Uh, we have a very specific methodology and framework that we use here. Uh, we start off with a, a 15 minute learning round where uh, Wayne is going to take us uh, through our our topic, and I'll introduce him in a sec. And then we'll uh, send you off into small groups uh, where you will. Uh, apply that knowledge to uh, to what you've been taught and come up with uh, ideas on how you might be able to implement it in uh, in your day to day. And then we'll bring everybody back. We will then vote on uh, all of the items that folks have uh, brought up in their mural board. And then finally, we will uh, have a discussion uh, with Wayne and I uh, around uh, those ideas and, and how we might uh, continue to optimize those as we move forward. So today uh, I'm joined by Wayne Simmons. Uh, he is the global CXM lead for Pfizer and a professor for our uh, CXM and MSU program, um, as well as the former CX leader at Bayer. Prior to that, prior to working within the industry, he worked, or worked for Optiv, training and coaching Fortune 500 companies on how to build and measure CX organizations across the globe. Today, Wayne is gonna take us through a framework for building a CXM case for change. So welcome, Wayne. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my uh, my slides set up here. All right, here we go. All right, I think we're just about in business here. So, well, thank you again, you know, Tom, for, for inviting me to this. So, what, you know, and Alistair for the introduction. So, when when Tom, you know, asked me to do this a few weeks back, um, it was, I had a lot of thoughts about different CX practices to, uh, to apply here, but I decided to focus on what I think is one of the, great challenges and great mysteries of the CX world. Uh, and that is CXM and customer centricity is a CEO level initiative, right? But somehow it gets put on to the CX team alone to drive it and make it a reality. So this, uh, this session is really about that. How do we activate and mobilize an organization to a point where it's, everyone's responsibilities. Customer centricity is everyone's responsibility. So this tool we'll, we'll go through this, this morning is about um, how you activate, how do you keep the organization focused on the why, and then how you drive it through to, to the end. So it, so with uh, customer centricity, what I, I like to say, you have to rewire organizational, operational, and commercial DNA in order to get to the end game. So this, this quote kind of captures it really, really well because it is a journey and it is a journey that again, that often the CX teams have to you know, carry the water by themselves. So this is about how do we get the rest of the organization behind it? And in particular, how do we get the leadership behind it as well? So this case for change framework we'll walk through, it's really about creating both clarity and urgency. So we think that CX is uh, the, the benefits of it are clear, you know, whether it's reduced churn, it's, you know, improving customer experience, it's improving MPS, whatever your objective is, it seems clear to us uh, often, but it's not necessarily clear to the organization. So we're going to try and, and get clarity about what we're doing, where we are, where we're going, and then bring some urgency by in as well to catalyze this journey uh, to customer centricity. So this compelling case of change idea, it's not about so much how do things it's really about you know what what's the cost what's the stake what's the cost of not doing something what's the cost of not changing so looking at it 
I won't get to the psychology of it, but I think it's it's more like how do we get people uh, urgent in understanding the penalty for for not being customer centric. So even though again the, the benefits of being customer centric are are fairly obvious to us and should be obvious to others, but it's uh, it often is not. So this case for change is both around five key questions. So I'm gonna, I'll pop the framework up now and kind of walk through each of the questions. Question number one, where are we today? So if you think about that, it's a very basic question. But if you're in a room getting leaders aligned about where the company is at the moment, as it relates to customer experience, you'd be surprised at how there are different perspectives about you know, where you are and what, what, the, what the pain is you may, may or may not be feeling, what the pain your customers may or may not be feeling. So getting aligned on the current state is really, really critical, critical first step. Next, it's like, where are you going? So if you're transforming an organization, you have to understand where you are, understand where you're going. Pretty basic stuff, but again, often missing in a transformation effort. So like really understanding what does the future state look like? What does our ideal future state look like? And getting clear about that is really, really important. Next is the case. So what's at stake if we don't change? You know, what's, what's the penalty for staying the status quo? And this is where that urgency comes into play. So you're really trying to get clear about that, uh, that case. And we'll, we'll dig deeper into that. That'll be the focus of our discussion today. Next, crit critical question, what are the barriers? What might stand in our way? Right, there's always new barriers to us getting from point A to point B, guaranteed. All kinds of barriers, technology barriers, our resource barriers, alignment barriers. So lots of stuff to, uh, to explore there. And fifth and finally, what's the roadmap? So given all of that, what's our game plan to get there? Short, medium, long-term game plan to get there. And that's the overall sort of structure of, of the case. And we're going to focus on number three today, but I just want to share all five questions. And they really work together to kind of paint that picture of what you're trying to do, why you're doing it, and, um, you know, where, where you're going and how you get there. All right. So the case for change itself, This I built a little canvas here that we can kind of use to annotate the actual case. But this is what I've used in the past. Just create a simple one-page canvas to capture all these different elements. And again, it's very, very, um, uh, it's very, very easy to do this, or logical to do this in a facilitated session with leaders, like walking through each of these different questions and trying to get them to align on the current, future, the barriers, the roadmap, and case. So, a really good facilitation tool. Now, the case has different elements to it. I'm just going to lay them out here. So. We think of, of the case for change uh, or the reason we're transforming and trying to be more customer centric, maybe in CX terms. What I'm trying to advance here is that there's multiple dimensions to that answer. What's, what's the case? What's the reason? There's an emotional dimension to it. There's a the functional dimension. There's a financial dimension to it. I think we all stick on financial quite a bit because it's what the organization seems to, to gravitate, gravitate to. So these different elements are for different audiences. And you really want to be in a position where you're defining all three of these, getting clear about all three of these from a leadership standpoint, so you can then drive it to different audiences. These different elements will, will resonate with different groups across the company. Sometimes they may need the financial, sometimes they need the emotional, sometimes they need all three of them to, to build a case and to understand the direction and the, the reasoning behind this drive to being customer centric. So those are three elements we'll, we'll dig into a little bit more. So this is an example of a, of a uh, hospitality company case for change, a store complete. There's a lot, lots of words on the, on the screen, but this is really meant to be more of a messaging guide. Like once you get this developed in, in the uh, facilitated sessions or, or rounds of sessions, this allows you to pick and choose different messages. But if you have this completed, it becomes basically the, the design brief for your uh, transformation journey. And depending on the situation, different uh, audiences may require different elements of this. So if the case for change in the middle there, you notice that it's really about the stakes, right? What's, what's the penalty? No one wants guest disappointment in this scenario. No one wants to increase that burden and no one wants to decline occupancy rates. So I'm not talking about customer experience management or customer centricity in, in these sort of philosophical terms. I'm talking about in very, very tangible terms that resonates 
the cost organization. So guest disappointments, the emotional element, you know, thinking about the idea of a hospitality company, disappointing a uh, guest, uh, impacting your plans, tarnishing their memories. That's a really, really powerful emotional uh, element and driver. Uh, on staff burden on the functional side. So the things that we do in customer experience impact frontline staff quite a bit. So putting burden on them is a, is a great uh, idea of a functional pace of change. And of course, financial, you know, declining occupancy rates, you know, killer in the hospitality business. So how customer experience or, or the lack of uh, customer centricity affects declining occupancy rates. So this, again, paints the picture of where the organization and why the organization needs to move forward. And, uh, in three different dimensions, three different audiences. And if you think about the current state, future state, very, very polar opposites, right? The current state, you wanna make that as painful as possible, like really, really identify the pain for the organization. That way you can then create the urgency to get to the other side, which is the future state. So very, very, you know, they're literally polar opposite uh, dimensions. And then of course the barriers of maps. This all gets, they cascaded down into strategy and into funding and into resourcing, into a transformation roadmap. Okay, so I think we're almost at time. So just the, from an exercise standpoint, we have a few minutes to kind of walk through sort of the fundamental question around these different areas. So for the emotional uh, element, think about the like, customer stories that illustrate the emotional impact. As a, the example I just had before about tarnishing memories, that's a, that's a, a great way to, to uh, articulate the customer's pain. In, uh, and then creating an emotional uh, need, emotional driver for being more customer centric and, and, and applying the disciplines of customer experience management. Uh, the functional side of things, think operationally, what are the inefficiencies and, and impacts on internal uh, staff, things that hinder the organization. So you kind of ask those questions in a facilitated session to get to uh, the functional case. And then the financial uh, case, how is the current situation impacting financial performance? Every industry has their own sets of drivers, every company has their own sets of drivers and triggers financially to uh, that will trigger senior leadership. So again, three different questions, one integrated message around a case for change and targeting different audiences and getting, equipping CX leaders to, uh, to have those conversations. And then, and also it keeps a, it creates a, a North Star as you go through the transformation journey, which could be multiple years it gives you a North Star to always remind you about why you're doing what you're doing. So those are the three elements, three questions. So I think we're, you know, Alistair, I'm not sure if we, if we want to transition over to the um, exercise, but for the exercise, you know, it, it, you're going to work into small groups and the idea is to pick a company, pick a brand, could be one of the brands that uh, or companies in your group, but think about a case for change in these three different dimensions. We have 15 minutes to, to do that, but just think about a, 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 uh, a uh, an ideal company or company that you all recognize or, or understand, um, and then go through and create a, a documented case for change around emotional, functional, financial dimensions, and then we'll come back and, and uh, go from there. So, Alistair, this is the, yes. do you want to go through yeah. that? <laughs> so we're going to, uh, Tom, Tom's working on uh, putting the groups together as we speak. He also put the uh, link to the mural board. Um, in uh, the in the chat, which is what we're going to use. Um, so what you're going to do, each of you will uh, be in a group of uh, three three to four people. Uh, you will grab a set of sticky notes uh, and you know use use those sticky notes one each for an emotional, a functional, and a financial case. But before you do that, definitely make sure you do introductions uh, within your group, um, and then uh, I think. What is your uh, what is your favorite fast food restaurant? Uh, will be the uh, will be the icebreaker. So, and just as a reminder, right. so so does everybody know what to do? Everybody in mural. Um. So there's a link in the chat to mural. Make sure you can get there. Um, you're, I think you have, you have to you have to provide your name and your email address to get in. Chat should just be your name and Everywhere. your name now because we upgraded our uh, we upgraded our mural. Yeah, it's paid for. So uh, all right, so I'm gonna assign you guys randomly. 
Yeah, you can be a visiting fish, Bill. That's fine. Although, yeah. That's what we're doing. Did, and you're all dating. I've, 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 I've called you worse in mixed I, company, but I, 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 appropriate for Bill. <laughs> so I have a I have a question. Can yes. you hear me? Um, yeah. I put my name in. Yeah. Is that what I'm supposed to do, or do I need to click on this link above it, or? You just should be able to put uh, your name in and, no, uh, and uh, hit save. You've got. You've, you've got to click on the, the mural link that I pasted in there. And okay. you need to join us in mural. You need Wait to join minute. us in mural. So, so okay. you should um, be in you should be in Okay, I'm a visiting crab. There you go. That's fine. Perfect. There you go. Your email All right. works. So put, hey, Tom, okay. Yes. So I need to put my work email so in here. I, I think I'm in I'm in mural, but um I don't see like a thing with my name on it. Do you no, see me? We're going to put you in the groups. Oh Tom's my God. Send you all off into groups. And then within your group, just pick a set of sticky notes. There's no assigned ones. I don't know how to do that. Okay. No, but like I'm seeing all these different people on the yep. screen as they're moving around. Uh, we're going to put, see... yep. put you in a breakout room so you can introduce yourselves and then you can even in introduce yourself as double visit on the fit. canvas sticky note okay. right as long, as long as you can click on and edit a sticky note in mural you're good to go okay cool yep all right okay guys i'm gonna get you into your rooms here and have fun you got 15 minutes all right so um thanks everybody uh looks like uh we we were able to to get some good good stuff in here so what we're actually going to do uh, and now that everybody um, has had a chance to put in their own thoughts, um, we are going to actually send you back into the mural board. Um, we're going to give you a, a, a minute, minute to here just to look at what everybody has posted um, so that you can familiarize yourself with what's going on. And then uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to vote. Um, and then uh, Wayne and I will pick out pick out some items on the the top vote getters and potentially other topics and we'll we'll talk about those uh, as we go through so uh give you just another 30 seconds here to make sure you've got a chance to read and um if you want to emphasize you can you're going to vote on your top three yep. so you may even want you know what i would recommend you do identify your top emotional top functional and top financial example and then Tom, we'll, you're going to uh, have to actually, uh, Tom, you're actually going to have to do the voting because I'm not an admin yet on the page. Well, I'm doing it. I just want to give them instructions before they start voting. So Perfect. I'm going to start the voting um, and any member here and go back and identify your top example for emotional, your top example for functional and the top for uh, financial. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start the voting. There you go. All right. So All go right. Ahead and, let's go ahead. And, yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Awesome. All right. So Wayne, we uh you you and I will discuss the uh top vote getters here or pick out I think we'll start with you, Wayne. Pick out one that you that you think uh you really like or well we got this one up here that got seven that got seven votes. Yeah. Six, Ooh. Yeah. Yep, you should probably go there. Yeah. What company is that from? Does anyone remember who posted this? It was for um, around a fast food or a pizza chain. Okay. Pizza chain. Interesting. So, you know, I would I would say for for this one again. I, I was telling the group that I was in, group seven, that there's no hard, fast rules about anything. Uh, what I try to, to, to do with the case for change, I try to evoke emotion. Like people respond to emotion. And and so like sitting in the customer's shoes, what pain are they going to feel interacting with us? And that's a really, really hard question to ask and answer in organization sometimes. You, sometimes you get so internally focused, you forget about that. So. I would just I would say sort of broadly that 
that emotional dimension is really, really critical because you feel it. You want people to feel it in your organization. You want your CEO to feel the, uh, the lack of uh, customer centricity and how it impacts customers at a human level. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, well, this is labeled as functional, you know, getting to the emotional piece around people nowadays really don't want to interact <laughs> for the most part with people, right? You want to be able to get your order in, watch it, watch it as it goes through the process. And I think uh, Domino's, uh, Domino's sort of took that to the next level uh, with their, uh, with, with what they do. So yeah. Um, good, uh, good example there. All right. So let's, let's go to, uh, and let's go to an emotional one. Let's go to this one on the, the left, uh, frustration after buying an item, which, uh, which company, which company was this? That was Ikea. Ikea. All right. <laughs> so frustration after buying an item that was returned and clearly been used. Uh, customers feeling shame for not knowing as much as employees and leaving customers disappointed and frustrated by instructions. Oh my gosh, the instructions for Ikea. I'm, I'm with you on the, uh, on the emotional uh, piece there. Um, the, can it, can uh, we get, get some color commentary on customers feeling shame for not knowing as much as employees? Wayne, you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll push it back to the group that they created. I'm curious about that myself. Like, what, what's the driver behind that? Yeah. Um, we talked about a couple of examples, but how sometimes you can go into a store or a place and feel a little bit shameful that you might not be as aware about the products or how they work as efficiently as someone that might work there, which it seems obvious, but if you go into a place expecting a certain outcome and then after talking to someone and realizing that you had a different idea with how the out that product should be used um it could make you feel a little like oh um, embarrassed maybe is a better word than shame but you yeah. feel embarrassed by how something works i mean i think from a from a case for change perspective if i'm the ceo of ikea and i hear that we're causing shame in our customers that's going to activate me to support this journey to customer centricity. It's going to, it's going to, so that that's a great trigger for like driving change. I mean, at least they'll ask group to learn more about that, and you want that you want that engagement from them. So that's a really good good uh, uh, you know strong statement. Yeah, good one. Well, right. I I, yeah, ahead, I think even the sense of frustration you feel. And it's been a long time since I've assembled anything from Ikea, even though Louisa loves their instructions. Um, I would be, you know, I would be thinking, who who wrote this thing? Um, why, why didn't they take these factors into consideration when I'm sitting here at home trying to put it together? Um, so I think even the extent to which customers, you know, sense that there's a lack of customer centricity um from the organizational level lack of empathy yeah and just to kind of kind of build so this one it's a really good example so if you're in an organization if you're in ikea you're you're a cx person in ikea and you go to the the team that that creates the instructions the complex instructions that we've all uh, we all experienced in our life um telling them that, that it's, it's complex and hard for customers to navigate is one thing telling them that that it's called exchange in customers. It's a totally different level of uh, activation and engagement. So really trying to, again, those two words, you know, urgency and clarity is kind of what we're trying to get to here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. All right. So let's take on with that. We've looked at functional financial. Let's see what we got. Uh, we've got uh, back to the pizza industry here. We're losing market share. Uh, Business returning to pre-COVID, and now and now you're competing against more than just pizza. Uh, yeah, certainly uh, bringing uh, bringing this in front of a CFO, right, to make sure that you know they understand that we we probably need to spend money to make money, um, and you know making the making the change on maybe the menu, uh, 
um, so that your customers feel more fulfilled uh, coming to your restaurant than uh, than maybe your competitors is a is a pretty good motivator for a CFO uh, to to give some uh, to give money towards uh, towards that R and D or or development. Any other thoughts on that one? All right. Wayne, any of these jump out at you? Yeah, I think the next one is probably Southwest, I, I believe, sort of guest uh, frustration, uh, low cost fares. I imagine that's Southwest. And that's a very interesting, if I that is Southwest, a very interesting dynamic there where you, you get what you pay for. And so if you pay a low cost fee, you deserve a low, low value experience, a low, a, a low quality experience. Uh, yeah. Interesting dynamic there. Um, yeah, and I think the guest frustration. So again, back to that emotional dimension to things. Like, think about if you're Southwest, the ZX team is Southwest. This is about time spent. I mean, people are spending time and money and trying to get from point A to point B to do whatever you know, whatever their life is calling them to do. And let and me ask it. Bar barrier to that is, is a, you know, a driver for change. Let, let me let me ask a question, Wayne, because um, I mean, my thoughts. Um, Southwest, um, typically, and, and, and this is part of their philosophy, I don't know that they always live up to it, but I think their mindset has typically been that you get more than what you pay for, right? I mean, like your bags fly free, you know, you get a bunch of different things with them, you don't have to pay change fees and all those kinds of things. Now, when I think that you get what you pay for in the airline industry, I think spirit. Oh now, my God. Really yeah. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> now, now, truth be told, I have actually never flown a Spirit flight before. I have. But, they nickel and dime but, you for everything. But, but it's based you on missed, you know. You haven't missed anything, Marvie. Yeah. Yeah, but I think so. Lori and I are the Southwest team, and I think that we added the you bet you know you um you get what you pay for. It's because that's the we were talking about the emotions of the people, right? When when you're going into um, and you're frustrated because your flight was canceled because there's not enough like pilots and things like that, you still paid a fare. So you're at least our mentality was like, I guess I, you know, it's like I guess I yeah. get what I pay for. So it's yeah. not more. It's not about like the actual. We're talking about the emotion of the individual, you know, purchasing the ticket more than the emotions that the company is trying to convey. Got it. Yeah. So more, Luis, just so I can, so I'm going to read that. But so it's, it's more that I've paid for this ticket and now you're telling me that I'm not going to be able to get on this flight. I'm not going to be able to get, okay, got it. Got it. They're just expecting the service to occur because they paid for well, the service. Right. No, I think what, I think what Louisa, correct me if I'm wrong, Louisa, is, you know, if I pay for Delta, I expect my flights to be on time i don't expect them to be canceled but if i'm only paying 48 dollars for a flight on southwest um it's gonna it's gonna happen and 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 that is that what you, what you mean that you kind of expect those things to happen we took the exercise from like what is the customer thinking or experiencing emotionally right so like if they are um, buying a ticket in southwest and now there's a lot of delays there's a lot of these things happening my feeling is always when I when I always go for a bargain at something and then it breaks, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I guess I I pay for that, right? Like I I just yeah. you know I deserve yeah. that because I pay so little. <laughs> but but, but, but yeah. can can I can I give a different perspective? Because when I again when I think Southwest, be, before the uh, the epic meltdown in December, um, I, I don't think that was typically the thought that 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 people have right and that's what Lori said Lori said like people love southwest and i'm like i never heard that but <laughs> i mean i think that i think the subtext here is that southwest in particular they've broken trust that they've earned they've built a, a, over a long period of time and that and that that's the mo to me that's the emotional trigger for the, the ceo of southwest to make change is this idea of like breaking trust with with uh with the with the you know with consumers and i think how do you get it back 
Yeah, and, that, and that's and, and so what we're talking about here, the case for change, breaking trust is a phenomenal driver to get the attention of the CEO to say, you know what, let's make those improvements. Let's make let's reduce our, our capacity. Of, you know, so whatever it takes to is a is, it's a great argument uh, from an emotional standpoint to uh, affect change. They not only broke trust with customers, they broke trust with pilots who were also stranded in, in that meltdown. So, yeah, and, and they in the Pilots Association testified in the Senate and said, we've been telling them since 2014 that there's a problem with this scheduling software and they've not done anything, even yeah. though there's been a, a, a breakdown every 18 months since then. So, so the this- writing was on the wall and they chose not to do something. So, Laurie, it's a great point because I would imagine they were making logical arguments inside of Southwest to, to fix that system. Like, you know, fix that it, it's broken. It's a functional right. argument that was. And they also chose to invest in other things that they thought would increase customer satisfaction instead. Yeah. But when you tie when you tie a breaking of trust and brand equity to that, it's a very different argument and a very different set of actions from leadership. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I you know, one of the things that I talk about, you know, within our master's program is like our difference as CX leaders is the experiential dimension, you know, or the and the emotional dimension. How do we infuse emotion into these arguments? It, Southwest knew that the system was antiquated and broken and was going to cause problems eventually, but that wasn't strong enough. And so tying emotion to it, customers' emotions to it, and then backing it up with data, of course, that makes that that moves the needle. Yep. Well, you know, it's interesting because I I think that there's a uh like a whole nother dimension that we have to think about post pandemic because I think that um you know companies have not really realized how critical this whole idea of business resilience is when it comes to the customer experience. And I mean, like I had I I had the same kind of experience with United not that long ago, um, where like a whole bunch of flights were canceled, and I had like four consecutive flights canceled. I was in my, you know, I was trying to get home two days later than my original flight, and go up to the counter, and people are telling me it's not my fault, it's the weather's fault. You know, I mean, it's like. Um, obviously they have not planned for this sort of stuff, right? So, which by the way, the CEO even went out and made some sort of a statement that it's not our fault. It's like the government's fault. It's like, are you serious? Yeah, yeah he did not take, taking ownership of a, of an issue at that level is probably the most important piece, right? Yeah. Accept responsibility. And actually that will help you build trust back with your customer base because uh, not everybody's perfect and everybody's going to have mistakes. It's, it's actually how you recover from those mistakes that ultimately set the tone for your company yeah. um, and actually can b- build stronger uh, brand loyalty if you if you recover, if you cover well from your own from your own mistakes. So. Yeah, just a quick up point. I know we're getting close to time. So yeah. th- there's a comment, uh, Alexis uh, made a a comment about I was the victim of a company, and you know, as CX practitioners, professionals, that should like shock us, right? Like we're uh, you know, how a company can victimize its consumers. Like you, know, you give a company money and they victimize you. So that's that's the battle we're fighting. That's the that's the driver and the, and the, the for change in these companies, and that's all of our companies. You know, we're all we're all guilty of it at some some level. So. When we talk about a case for change, which is our topic today, like this is the stuff we've got to get to. And like, you know, the CEO of Southwest needs to understand that fixing an antiquated system makes perfect sense. You should do that no matter what on a logical basis. But victimizing customers is a real reason to move them from point A to point B. Hey, Wayne, I've got one last closing question for you. You've talked a lot here about the importance of emotions. How do you how do you communicate those emotions and what form to the C-suite to get their attention? The reason I ask is I know the Delta leadership were being fed verbatims and it wasn't getting through. 
And that's why Delta converted to a system for, for ga gathering video feedback, because video can, can, can really um, capture the emotions, voice, tone, and facial expressions, and so forth. So how do you, how do you convey emotions effectively to C-suite to really get their attention? I mean, you just nailed it. But you, that's my answer. I was going to say, you know, video, but at, at the highest level, customer stories are, are the best arguments. You can put a spreadsheet in front of leadership teams all day long on value benefits, but really it's about those customer stories that, uh, that move, that move them as humans. So is that really then to a, a move away from quantitative data to qualitative data? I, I, you know, I've been hearing that a lot lately too, um, just because, uh, you know, maybe it's 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 helping to alter the way people think. If if they're making decisions every day and judgments just on how many percentage points certain indicators move, rather than understanding um, the emotions behind those those changes and the and the and the and the specific customer um, situations. You know, Tom, I would argue both of those elements, qualitative and quantitative and qualitative uh, stories. And I think that if you if you really if we're all honest. We spend a lot of our time on the quantitative, and you know, the quantitative is sort of a bolt-on. So I think they're they're equal, and depends on the audience and, and the context. But you need both of those dimensions, and all three elements of the case for change. I agree. We've said, we've just spent the last month and a half uh, with a third-party vendor gathering additional churn, you know, tr understanding our, you know churn reasons, and we we were able to get the get our board to buy off on on spending the money because we we put that emotional piece in front of it. We we have the qualitative or the quantitative clearly in front of us, but we needed to make sure they understood from the customer's voice why we needed to spend money in in these particular areas. So uh it's looks it like we have a question from Ms. Scott Lynch at Mesa. Uh not a question, yes, uh just a comment. I want to uh, say Getting big data is nice and fine and all good, but like we said, if the data is not quantitative, um, where you can actually look at it and see its value to the customer, to the recipient, it doesn't mean a darn thing. It might mean a lot to your IT or to your stats team, but it doesn't mean anything to the customer. And if the information is supposed to be user-friendly, the quality have to be there. For sure. We're, we're all humans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we are right at the top of the hour. Um, so want to thank everybody um, for uh, for joining us today. Um, our uh, we've got our September um, roundtable all all set and ready to go. Um, and we're going to be joined uh, by uh, Peter Armely. Um, he is the vice president of customer success at uh, ESG. Uh, which is a customer success consulting company. Um, Peter has been in the industry now for uh, 25 uh, plus years, even well before it was called uh, customer success. Um, and he's going to talk, we're going to continue to expand on uh, how do we drive a customer centric uh, organization. Um, and uh, Peter's going to come next time to talk to us about that. So we hope everybody joins us again in September. And uh, we look forward to, uh, look forward to seeing everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, guys. Good to see you. Take care.